today we're going on a route I call the bridge to bridge route we'll be traveling about 20 miles and going from the community I live in and back to the community again the uh, first bridge we'll go over is the hammock bridge and then we'll go down the coastal a1a and then finally get on to the Flagler Bridge, which will bring us back to uh, our road that heads north back to the community. Now I've raised the camera up a little on this trip and I've also set it to a wider angle than I had before so hopefully we'll have a good video and it won't be too low. Alright, we're out of the community and by the uh, road. Now we're heading north into a pretty good wind which is good because when we head south on the coastal highway, the wind should be at our back and that'll be fine. So right now we're heading at about north at about 14 and a half miles an hour in PAS three and gear five. I hope you can hear me on this one. I think I'll put it in PAS four against this uh, headwind. There we go, much better. Still pedaling, still putting some effort in, but conserving the effort for the 20 mile trip. Bit cool out today in the mid 60s, and with the wind it feels cooler. But as you can probably see, there's not a cloud in the sky. And that's nice. I guess you get the radiant heat from the sun, as I've said in other videos. About 15 years ago, this road, Colbert, didn't go all the way from it's beginning and end. It's only a short road. It stopped halfway down because these developments weren't built. And uh, maybe 15, between 15 and 18 years ago, they uh, completed it. And now in 2023, they're building additional communities along it. which is okay. They're single family homes and that's fine. Now along another road that branches off of this road, this is Colbert. They're building, I think, uh, apartments and lots and lots of them. That increases the density of the population here. And I'll probably have to do something with the infrastructure to accommodate the increase in uh, population up Palm Coast. This uh, PAS-4 is really doing a nice job allowing me to go about 18 miles an hour against a headwind. But still pedaling, still putting effort in. Pulling about 360 watts from the uh, battery. Typically in PAS 3 and gear 4 or 5, you pull about 95 to maybe 150 watts. 
and, and that's why in PAS3 you can travel further, less usage to the battery. Speaking of the battery, I'm no longer doing mileage tests with the battery. I know I can travel, you know, quite a, a ways uh, while uh, pedaling in PAS3. And if I put it in PAS4, I lose about 20 miles of total distance, but still over 50 miles. in pedal assist mode and PAS4 a beautiful day today a little cool but beautiful just like the trip I took to uh, the Lehigh Trail but uh, I didn't have the camera pointed correctly on that one And I don't believe I had it in uh, wide angle. It was standard. And uh, I don't know how that happened because on a previous video, I was in wide angle. Anyway, we're shooting this in 1080p. And the next time we go out, we'll shoot in 2.7K and maybe 4K and see the difference if it really uh, makes much of a difference. Certainly those two settings use up more of the memory card faster, you know, so if this is fine, we'll keep it like this. Again, we're riding on the sidewalk here because the uh, bike lane is very narrow at this point. Further south or behind me, it opens up and it's a usable bike lane, but here it's really not. And we're coming to the place where I'm going to, uh, oh, continue, it's just, never mind. <laughs> We have a little more ways to go before I cross this road and another and get onto the linear trail, which will take me to the Hammock Bridge. I don't know if you can tell on the video with the stabilization is set, but this part of the sidewalk is very ripply, it's almost like a, a moderate washboard. And uh, thank goodness for the hydraulic front shocks, fork shocks, that certainly uh, calms it out quite a bit, smooths it out, you know. So we're passing a, uh, I guess an assisted living facility coming up here on the left. And uh, I believe it's quite expensive to 
be there, include your meals and the assistance, but it's, I believe, it's over $7,000 a month. And to me, that's a little bit high. But that's me. I know my brother is in a, uh, a senior living community where they have a two bedroom, two bath apartment they rent. They got all their meals included and much of the uh, services are included, maybe not the telephone and Wi-Fi and stuff, but all the other services are included. And they pay for both of them only 6,000 a month. And that's up in Virginia, near Richmond. Very nice place, by the way. Fairly new. Year or two old. something interesting coming up like they're doing some work around the trees that looks like uh, tree green is doing it or tree time green something like that. some company like that is doing it all right now we're getting closer to that light I was talking about a minute ago Let's see if this person lets me go they did okay. now pedaling in PAS3 we're doing about 15 or so miles an hour as you may have heard on previous videos I had squealy brakes and I switched from an acetone spray to another kind of a spray that claims they don't have acetone and so far it's been working very very well. Alright, here's the light. Need to wait for the signal. There it goes. cross over here and then we're going to cross the other way that sun sure feels good nice and warm take the chill off from the ride here we go lights changing now So as I mentioned, I used a different spray on the brakes and I applied it again today and it seems to have removed the squeal at least 90% and uh, you don't have to apply it every trip, which is nice. With the acetone, I had to apply it every trip and sometimes during the trip they would start to squeal again. But the brakes work very well, they're hydraulic brakes, no problem with uh, not working as well as they had before I put the spray on. They certainly work as good uh, without the squeal. That makes it nice. We're coming up to uh, St. Joe's. I don't know what it's called. St. Joe's Trail, St. Joe's Parkway. And it's a bike path that takes us in a linear park. St. Joe's Walkway. Maybe you can see the sign there. But it's a trail 
that goes in the green area between the east and west direction roads of a road called Palm Coast Parkway. And it goes a long way. Sometimes there are businesses in it and sometimes there are paths and little parks in it, like playgrounds. As a playground coming up on my right, you'll see a bridge and some people coming out. Woman uh, wasn't paying any attention at all, and her dog would have walked right in front of me, so I had to give a little toot. And the expected reaction of startled was there, but at least she smiled and hopefully understood. It was more concern for her dog than anything else that I tooted the horn. You see the wind here is being blocked by the trees and I hope you can see the trees. I have this raised up. I hope it's raised up enough. I'll raise it up just a little more so you can see how beautiful this trail is as many of our trails are. Now we'll be taking a left here that continues eastward along the eastbound lanes of Palm Coast Parkway. Of course, if you stay on Palm Coast Parkway, you go right over the bridge unless you make a turn off of it. Now here's a place, Jehovah's Witness bought this about five years ago and I understand it's a training center or something to that effect for Jehovah's Witnesses and they have signs up that it is private do not enter unless you have a purpose there these paths sometimes are nice and curvy makes it fun to ride more towards the center of the path, the trail, the walkway, <laughs> as they call it, St. Joe's Walkway. It does head further west from where we got on, I guess another mile maybe, and uh, then Ed's end where you need to get on a sidewalk. And we have plenty of sidewalks here to walk and ride bikes on. Very enjoyable. All right, there's the bridge ahead of us. And we'll uh, cross over here when it's safe. Get over to the walkway. And the answer is yes, it does take a little bit of a learning curve to know uh, where these paths go and how to get on them and get onto the bridge lane rather than on the road or the sidewalk. You don't want to be on the sidewalk going across the bridges because they are very narrow and uh, you pass a lot of walkers. And so we're going to stay in the bike lane. We'll see if we can keep it in PAS 3, maybe gear 4. Okay, we're 
We're now in the bike lane of the Hammock Bridge. I'm in PAS 3 and gear 4 and no problem getting up the bridge at all. Now with the headwind, I think what I'll do is put it in PAS 4. And get a little more speed. And these e-bikes are wonderful for going over hills and bridges. I know you can't hear what I've heard because I have Bluetooth from my phone directly to my hearing aids, which I needed to get a few months ago. And it was telling me I did uh, five miles and I averaged 14.1 miles per hour, which isn't bad. I'm in gear six and seven. You can see the walkers in the uh, sidewalk or on the sidewalk, and uh, it's not good to try to ride a bike there. Oh, a little squeal, not much. going to make a sharp hairpin turn here and go down to the sidewalk along route A1A and take that south for about maybe eight miles or so. Again, the sidewalk, I believe, is a little safer here then the bike lane you can see the speed of the traffic and uh, the bike lane is wide on this side but on the other side is not quite as wide so heading north I probably would take the bike lane but heading south I think I would rather be on the sidewalk This is Route A1A. It is the coastal version of Route 1, which goes from, I believe, all the way to Miami up to Maine. A1A, I'm not quite sure how far it goes contiguously, but I know in places it branches from Route 1 and proceeds along the coast. Now in this area, This is the closest A1A gets to the Atlantic Ocean. Although there is a place up north on my trip to the Matanzas Inlet video, you'll see that it also gets rather close there and crosses over areas that join the Infracoastal and A1A. I mean, and the uh, Atlantic Ocean, the Infracoastal and the Atlantic Ocean. But here, in a little bit, we'll head closer to the shore. And as we get into, I guess, Flagler Beach or a little couple of towns like Beverly Beach above it, you'll see how close it is to A1A. As a matter of fact, in Flagler Beach, the last storms we had removed part of the road that removed the ocean side or the northbound lane of the road by undermining it from wave action and it had to be replaced 
I think during after Hurricane Matthew, and then when Hurricane Ian and Tropical Storm Nicole came up here, it again had to be replaced. Not quite as much of the road, but a bit. Now, Ian came in with a big storm surge, and it caused about 20 homes to collapse into the beach and the ocean. And they were very far back. And that point, I believe, up Orman Beach. The beach was very wide, maybe 60, 70 feet wide. And then the people had 40 feet of grass and backyard that was supported by a seawall. So their backyard was nice and level. Well, the waves came in, removed the beach, removed the seawall, and removed the 40 feet of yard that these homes had, and either caused the homes to collapse down or be so damaged they had to be removed and uh, replaced. It was uh, quite something to see. So we're cruising along about 18 miles an hour. Maybe you can see that. And I hope the video is up high enough so you can see the beautiful area that we're in. The community on our right, I'll try to turn a little bit, maybe you can see it. It's called Island Estates. And it's a very private community with a, uh, a guard. And to get in there, they will not only take your driver's license and record your plate number, but they will call the people to ensure you were invited to get in the community. So they're kind of uh, very uh, upscale, and people like their privacy and security. I know some people who live there, very nice community in. I wouldn't mind living there, but I certainly wouldn't want to pay the million dollars or two for a house and the taxes. I enjoy where I live. A lot of uh, amenities, amenities for what you pay, and a great bunch of people. Couldn't have nicer neighbors now friends uh, that live there. So we retired there about 12 years ago, almost 13 years ago now, and we've loved every minute, every minute being there. So you can see we've gotten a little closer, or maybe you can, to the beach, and here are some big beach homes that have been built, and they're quite substantial. They seem to be built well because uh, some of them have sustained a couple of hurricanes or more, maybe three or four hurricanes and many storms with minimal damage. Now one thing to note, when you live close to the beach like this, on the beach or in a community that's very close to the salt water, any metal that you have corrodes. If you have metal soffits, they corrode. If you have a hot tub, you may have to change a motor every two years. Pools, the same. It's very corrosive to be in an area where the air carries so much salt from the uh, wispy wave action. And you can see it in the distance some days. It's very hazy, and it's not hazy because of fog or low clouds. It's hazy because of the misty air coming up when you have a, uh, an onshore breeze. Now, onshore breeze means the wind is coming from the ocean to the land. In this case, it's coming from the east and the breeze is going west. That whips the air up and blows the, 
the uh, the waves into shore. Now the other one is called an offshore breeze. In this case, the offshore breeze would go from the land in the west to the ocean in the east. And that's called a surfer's wind because the wind actually holds the waves higher. As they're breaking, the wind gets pushing against them or under them and holds the waves higher and makes it a nicer ride for surfers. It also makes a lot of wispy, I guess what you call it, watery action because of that. But since it's blowing offshore, it doesn't come into the land. It just blows more further out to sea. Now here's a park on the left called Varn, V-A-R-N Park. And uh, when I go beach fishing, surf casting, I usually go here. You'll see some cars parked there, and I go there where the cars are. And we have to cross the road because the sidewalk now continues on the west side of the road. But that's Varn Park, and I can't say I've caught a lot there, but once we caught five whiting or southern kingfish, and that was quite nice to eat. I filleted them. You don't get big fillets out of them, but I did fillet them, and I coated them in tatarans, which is a coating known to be from Louisiana, with a little Cajun spice in it, and they were absolutely delicious when they were fried in butter. Just delicious. Couldn't have been better. So uh, I think I'll go back there and try to go fishing again. But the thing I didn't like about fishing there is that I had a big wagon and the wagon had all my gear in it. Two poles or three poles and reels and three boxes of lures and weights and things. And because there's an angle coming off the beach, you have to lift it up a hill. After a day of fishing, it was just a bear. I mean, truly, it wasn't fun. So my buddy and I decided we would go fishing again, but certainly trim that down to just the essentials we needed for the fish we wanted to catch that day. A lot of different fish you can catch this there. You can catch uh, redfish out there. You can catch pompano, which is the most delicious food. Here comes a real tight one. Yeah, got through that okay. Uh, pompano, which is a white meat, like the uh, whiting are, but sweeter. You can catch uh, all sorts of fish, sharks, of course, and uh, different fish, different times, different seasons, you know. So it's, it's fun to be able to just drive over to the shore most all shores are free to fish and free for people in Florida and just go out and fish and have a nice fish dinner of freshly caught fish that night. All the shore area is building up just like the rest of our towns in northern east northeast Florida. I'm sure everywhere they're building, but here it's uh, especially prolific because it's a lot of area that hasn't been built upon. And uh, it's a nice area. The reason I moved here, one is the proximity to the Atlantic Ocean, which I enjoy. And the second reason that I like the change of season. We normally have about three seasons here. Spring and fall are the absolute best. Every day you wake up and you can't believe how nice it is. Just beautiful weather. And then you have the summer, which is hot. Never goes into the hundreds, but it's in the 90s with high humidity. So it is warm and you have to dress appropriately and put on sun lotion. And the winter, like now, this is February 6th. I'm just wearing a long sleeve shirt, a vest, a pair of light pants, long pants, 
and a couple of sh some uh, like sneaker shoes and I, the other day I didn't even wear that I wore a short sleeve shirt and shorts so it just depends on the day but today I felt there was going to be a little more wind and that always makes it feel cooler There's a house just being built over there. Can you see it? It's brown. That's new construction. And you can see the small houses next to them. Those are original houses. Uh, many times people build here before the uh, land value went up and they homestead and they can live there for not too much money. If the houses are smaller and when they retire or decide they've had enough, that property would be worth quite a bit. I'm gonna I'm just up just a touch more, see if that's any better. What I'll do is stop over here and see how it uh, recorded. Okay, we're back on again. Everything looks good. I have raised this up just a little, but I think I'm going to raise it a little more and see if that's a little better. Every time I think I have this in the correct position, I look and uh, see it's still a little bit low. And that's not as much fun as seeing the beauty of the road ahead or the path ahead, trees, sky, etc. According to uh, our map here, we're almost halfway through the trip. You can see over there, there's a uh, trailer park to my left. And that place is always full because it's right on the ocean. And the spots for the campers by the uh, ocean itself is quite expensive per night and then when you move away from the ocean a little it's not quite as expensive and on the other side of the road to my west uh, they have more slots and those are less expensive but if you go to Florida and you want to camp with your RV on the beach with the beach right down the ladder uh, that's the place now here's another one. This is even larger. You can see it here. I'll, I'll try to turn. Can you see it there? It's quite large and it has slots on both sides. And that is uh, much bigger trailer park in a town called Beverly Beach which is just north of Flagler Beach and almost uh, not quite due west of, I mean due east of where I live actually I'm a little north of that I think we'll take this down to three As I said, the wind appears to be at our back, so it's a lot um, quieter and a lot easier to pedal. So in PAS3, I'm in gear six. I'm doing about 17 miles an hour. So it's quite nice. down to 16 pump it up a little put it in gear five there we go so if you can cruise at 17 miles an hour in PAS 3 that's fine 
and the amount of battery power you save is immense. Right now, I'm pulling about 30 watts from the battery, traveling at 16 to 17 miles an hour. Uh-oh, gotta stop. Okay, what happened was I hit a bump as I was coming up over a street and it was so big that I knew to lift myself off the seat. I have a nice padded seat, but not a hydraulic seat. And as I did hit the bump, it lifted the bottle out of my carrier and dumped it on the ground. So I had to go back and get my, my bottle, which I now have. And I took a drink. So that's all good. Thank you. Getting a little more populated here, and it seems to be a lot of dogs. Wonder if there's a dog event or something going on here. On your left. Thank you. A lot of dogs today, huh? Sure. Something going on? I, I guess there's nothing going on. Okay, now we're entering a town called Flagler Beach. It's claimed to fame as a pier, which is being rebuilt because it uh, got some damage in three hurricanes and became shorter and shorter. And now it's uh, you know, beyond repair. So they're going to strengthen and preserve the uh, beginning 100 feet of it or so and then build a higher pier about 18 feet higher and further out into the water it's a fishing pier and uh, quite a good one catch a lot of fish there sheephead and reds i think some stripers is there too quite nice And also, Flagler Beach is known to be a throwback. Afternoon. It's a throwback to, uh, I guess, maybe the 60s, 70s, because the buildings are not allowed to be any taller than three stories. And as you can see here, here's two and three story buildings. As a matter of fact, if you have a two story building and want to replace it, you can't go to three stories unless you get approval. And if you had a three story, you can replace it with a three story. There's one building coming up here, a condominium, that I believe is 13 stories. And they got that approved because there was no rule against it at the time. Just nobody traditionally had built anything taller because they wanted to preserve the community. So after that, happened Flagler Beach passed a law rule ordinance whatever it was that banned any building higher than three stories and you can only replace what you had unless you got permission to add the third story on a two-story structure so you can see that unlike St. Augustine Beach Daytona Beach Part of Orman, Daytona Beach South, the shores, all of those have 
just building after building after building right on the ocean. And here you can see that the ocean, can you see that? The ocean is very close to A1A, it's right there. And there's a lot of uh, shrimp boats out today. On your left, thank you. So this is as close as A1A gets to the Atlantic Ocean. And the beach here is probably 20, 30 feet. And it's at low tide. Many of these uh, walkways and stairs that go down to the beach are no longer usable because of Hurricane Ian and Tropical Storm Nicole. They washed away so much beach that in part of Orman, where the houses collapsed, they found a ship, the, the skeleton of a ship that had sailed in the 1800s and had been buried all these years under 12, 15 feet of sand and now was uncovered. They did some testing on it and decided to let the sand cover it up again and leave it in order to not erode it any further. And that's what they did. Couldn't be a nicer day. This is north part of Flagler Beach. On your left. Thank you. People have headphones on or earplugs, airpods, airpods, earplugs, whatever, and they're listening to music or something and they just don't hear you when you uh, announce yourself. I don't really like to use the horn because then you get people jumping. And uh, I really don't want to see people jump. I think I'm going to stop up here because somebody called me and I need to mark down that information. So we're back on again, traveling south along A1A on the sidewalk. Looking at the ocean. See if I can get over there and I'll show you what it looks like. This is the Atlantic Ocean. And the beach. This is probably mid-tide or low-tide. Anyway, that's the Atlantic Ocean right along Route A1A in Flagler Beach. Okay, back on our trip. They're rebuilding that establishment. It was a good bar and hamburger place with food, very nice. And I guess the rent got too high for them, so we moved over on a street that's off of the ocean. And still doing pretty well. He kept his uh, loyal crowd, which is nice. Here's a nice place, breakaway. Breakaways is uh, known for their sushi. 
You wouldn't think they were, but they are. They're very, very good. Now we're getting into more downtown Flagler Beach. people. Guys uh, double parked trying to figure out where to put his truck I guess for delivery and people behind him are afraid to go around him. All right. There's another eatery, Fargo. I don't know if that's still open or not. It used to have Italian-style, Napolitana-style pizza, which are flatbread pizza, which is very good. That a real good pizza place, Rockies. People not looking, just not looking. Excuse me, on your right. Thank you. Yeah, that is just weird. Now we're approaching the Flagler Bridge, which heads west from Flagler Beach into Palm Coast. in the street rather than the sidewalk Let's see if this guy sees me I will go in the bike lane here too rather than the sidewalk you could probably see how narrow that sidewalk is pretty narrow I'm gonna put it in four Get a little speed up the hill No problem at all going up these bridges, not even a little. I am in gear five. Pretty good, and I'm gonna be passing this biker. Although, I don't know, I don't like the glass in the margin. Okay, let's hope we didn't pick up any glass. Intercoastal. I don't know if you can see it there, probably not. But we're going over the Intercoastal Waterway. And I'm going to put it into gear six. Now gear seven. there in gear 7 and PAS 4 I get it up to 29 miles an hour 
and that's uh, a personal best coming down that bridge. Sometimes I take that other road, I pass to my right, which is Roberts Road, and I'll take that home. But a friend of ours had an e-bike, got a flat tire because they're building houses there, and a little U-shape, kind of a nail, was bent and it stuck up and went right through her tire and tube and all that anti-flat and she went right down. So, until they're finished, I'm just gonna stay here on this sidewalk. Coming along Route 100, and I'll get to Colbert and make a right and head north back to the community. So far, we've done 15.4 miles, and uh, Looks like about 57 minutes. So it'll probably be about an hour and a half to do the trip. Maybe a little less. Not bad for a 20 mile trip. We have that headwind again. You can see the sidewalk, I hope, and you can see the patches of white. That's all new sidewalk. And the reason they have to put that in is that the sidewalk cracks. You can just see a piece crack there. And what cracks it, what cracks it is the trucks that go over the sidewalk so the lawn cutters can get to that portion on my left where you see the fire hydrant. And by going over this sidewalk, they break it all the time. Nobody ever thinks about maybe putting a ramp in or just have them park in the margin. But, nope. Spent all that money every year to repair sections of the sidewalk. If I had to repair a section that big, they charge me $400. Right there, that one. $400. And I've had three sections, $300 apiece. That's a rather expensive repair. Now, our repairs are necessary because the community, in its wisdom, quote unquote, thought it would be nice for everyone to have live oak trees in the margin between the sidewalk and the street curb. Well, now that the trees are getting bigger and the roots are growing, they're pushing up the sidewalk, making a tripping hazard. And if they had put rebar in, like they should have, they wouldn't have had the problem. But without the rebar holding the sections level, even if they raise up, they'll raise up equally. Uh, you get one slab that raises up above the other and either you have to repair it, replace it, or you have to have somebody come along and grind it for you. And that grinding was about $40. So one of my neighbors 
now has a grinder with a diamond wheel on it and he's able to grind the sidewalks for us or let us borrow it and we can grind our edges ourselves and that's what we do Now I do have a discrepancy between my GPS's. The uh, Map My Ride GPS says I'm at almost 16 miles and my GPS on the uh, hay bike says I'm at 16.5 miles. So I tend to believe the uh, Map My Ride and that's what I'll be using in the future. Perhaps going over a bump like I did move the the pickup for the sensor on uh, distance. I'm sure it's a pickup in the wheel. They know it's a 26 inch wheel. And they know every time it goes around it's gonna go a certain distance. Where the map my ride is the GPS and that picks up your location from satellites and I believe works in conjunction with your iPhone or Samsung phone to give you an ac accurate location and I believe the distance is correct. So even in the wind like this, we're traveling about 17 miles an hour between 16.8 and 17 and uh, PAS4, we're only one bar down on the meter. Which isn't much. Now this headwind is pretty strong and uh, I tried to go back to PAS 3 and gear 4 wasn't making very much progress so I switched it to PAS 4 and gear 5 and now I'm back up to 16 and a half or so miles an hour that's nice must have let up a little. I'm over 17 miles an hour again. So far, so good. It's been a very nice trip. Hope you enjoyed it. I hope the camera was up high enough this time so you could see it a little better. And I hope I had the wide angle wide enough so you could see all the nice things we're passing on the sides.
on the left here is a parking lot for the Graham Swamp Preserve and really what it is is the trailhead for a mountain bike loop a couple of different uh, routes that go through the Graham Swamp and many times you'll have uh, contests or meets here and see cars up and down the road There's a little retention pond, you can see it. They have those along the roads to get, collect the water and keep the roads dry. There are drains in the little ditch area to my left of the, left of the sidewalk, and those drains go into those retention ponds, I believe that we might also have sores, but I'm thinking not. Okay, almost 18 miles. Later I'll have to see how hard the wind is actually blowing. Seems quite uh, strong, especially biking into it. off to my right called Herschel King Park and in that park they have a nice boat ramp two ramps there a nice pavilion to uh, have a little picnic or an outing and some of the groups I belong to used to uh, go there and that's on the south side of my community on the north side there's another park called Waterfront Park and that's just a nice place with a bathroom and a bike repair station and a, a little dock to fish from but they're building up there what they call a kayak launch or a kayak ramp and uh, that should be fun a parking lot and lots of room for your trailers if you need it and you'll be able to go in the intracoastal from either of those parks or both parks you know so that should be finished this year sometime and i'll uh, take a video of it maybe one video i'll actually do a kayak trip from there up and down the intracoastal we'll see It's a pleasure to have PAS4 available and be pedaling into a strong headwind at 17 miles an hour. I know if I put it in PAS5, I'd probably do 20 miles an hour, maybe 19, 20. 
but don't need that. Well, we're getting back to our community and we'll do about 19 miles according to this uh, the way we travel this trip and that's perfectly okay with me so again this was the bridge to bridge route through Flagler Beach and back again If you like this video, I'd appreciate if you might subscribe and uh, send me a like. It always helps. I'm new to putting up videos and would appreciate that. And with that, I'm going to enter our community as we have on many other occasions. And thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and I look forward to seeing you on the next video. Bye-bye.